Hi, and welcome back to Focal Point AAFR Talk. Brian Fisher is my name. The program is Focal Point. This is free for all Friday on Focal Point, so we'll be happy to talk about whatever is on your mind. Number to call if you want to join the program, and we will take calls throughout the program today. 888-589-8840 is the number to call. We've been talking here about the passing over the last several days of Margaret Thatcher, who was the Ronald Reagan of the UK. And they're going to have a huge funeral for her. They're, they're going to have more pomp and ceremony for any funeral since the death of Winston Churchill. Now, here, here's the point. What this, what this tells us, this tells us something profound. She's vilified. She's demonized. She was hated by the left in the UK. But now, as they come to honor her, she is now the most honored Briton since Winston Churchill. She actually moved the needle. She changed the course of the UK's history. And people recognize that, friend and foe alike, recognize that she made an enormous impact. Why? Because she said at one point, this lady is not for turning. She had principles. She stuck to them. She, wasn't, uh, she did so without wavering. She did, though, despite being vilified and demonized, just as Ronald Reagan did. And she turned the course of the U.K., just as Ronald Reagan did in the United States. And so notice that that kind of principled leadership brings respect. It may not bring you affection. It may bring you demonization, but at the end of the day, even your adversaries respect you. And they did that, and they're doing that with uh, Margaret Thatcher. It's going to be the biggest funeral since Winston Churchill. Uh, you know, and it's a reminder, again, I, I guess the lesson I want to, and I want to encourage us with this, moderates do not change history. It is principled conservatives who change history. You know, it's like Ann Coulter used to say, you know, there aren't any groups out there committed to stopping Lamar Alexander. Why? Because he doesn't represent a threat to anybody. Lamar Alexander is a total squish when it comes to values issues, so he doesn't threaten anybody. He just goes along and gets along, collects his paycheck, enjoys the perks of being a senator, but he doesn't represent any threat to the interests of the left, nor does he represent an asset to conservatism. He's just a non-entity. And Margaret Thatcher was not like that. She had principles. She was not for turning. She was going to stick to them. And those are the people that changed the world. It's not moderates. Moderates are those that concede, they capitulate, they give way to the pressure. It's the people that don't, that have conservative principles and stick to them. They are the ones that are remembered, and they are the ones that change history. Now, in uh, California today, the Republican National Committee is meeting, and they're going to decide whether to reaffirm. There's a resolution before them to reaffirm the Republican Party platform. Now, what's important about this is the Republican Party platform takes a very clear and unapologetic stand about both the sanctity of life and the sanctity of marriage. And that's what conservatives, our own President Tim Wildman, along with 12 other socially conservative leaders, sent a letter to the RNC uh, uh, urging them to vote for this resolution, to, uh, to reaffirm the commitment of the Republican Party to the principles of the platform, particularly when it comes to the issue of marriage, because we've seen Republicans falling off the wagon here, right and left. Mark Kirk fell off the wagon. Senator Rob Portman fell off the wagon. Reince Priebus is right on the edge of the wagon. He'd love to jump off, and probably the only thing that's stopping him is he knows it would be suicidal. It would be the end of his career in politics if he did that. So this is a critical day. Uh, this is a very, very important day for us, ladies and gentlemen. It's a day of decision for the Republican Party. And I will guarantee you, if the Republican National Committee does not overwhelmingly, in fact, I think if they don't unanimously, well, maybe not unanimously, but if they do not overwhelmingly approve the party platform, it's going to be trouble for the Republican Party. If they don't approve the platform, it's going to be the end of the Republican Party. I mean, we could be witnessing the end of the Republican Party. And that vote may have already been taken. I may just not have seen the results of it yet. But if the Republican National Committee votes to support sodomy-based marriage, they withdraw their support for natural marriage, I will flat-out guarantee you they will be finished as a political force in America. 
That could happen today. They're considering a decision right now. Maybe they've already made the vote. I don't know. But they are facing a decision today that will determine whether the Republican Party in America even has a future. Now, Tony Perkins, a family research counsel, he's publicly said Politico's got a story about it. He has publicly told conservatives, look, don't give a dime, not one single dime to the Republican Party until they get their minds right on the issue and the subject of marriage. And he's exactly right to do that. Conservatives shouldn't give one single dime to the Republican Party unless it makes a decision to stand for the values that we share. Now, I wanted to just mention one other little detail in connection with Margaret Thank, uh, Thatcher. Story here in World Magazine about two of her grandchildren. Michael Thatcher, the only grandson of former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, in keeping with tradition, works behind the counter at a store in Texas. The younger Thatcher is a, quote, committed Christian and political conservative. His sister Amanda is a hurdler, sings in a choir, and traveled to China on a missions trip. Both will be in London for their grandmother's funeral next week. So the Christian legacy of Margaret Thatcher being carried on by her grandchildren. A writer by the name of Matt Lewis, he's a conservative. He's got a piece in a publication called The Week where he calls on the secular media to make a point of hiring Christian journalists. And the reason he says is simple. Look, 77% of the American people identify themselves as Christians. You can't hardly find a Christian in any newsroom in America. In fact, he mentions uh, the example of a reporter by the name of McCandlish Phillips. The New York Times did an obituary of him. And here's what the New York Times noted in its obituary of McCandlish Phillips. An evangelical Christian, he kept a Bible on his desk and led prayer meetings for like-minded colleagues. There were none when he joined the paper. But by the time he left, because of his influence, influence, because he was shining as a light in a darkened world, in time there were colleagues with whom he could have Bible studies in an adjoining conference room. Uh, the Times says this about Phillips. He refrained from smoking, drinking, cursing, and gambling, each of which had been refined to a high exuberant art in the Times newsroom. The last of these, to such a degree, gambling, that at mid-century, the newspaper employed two bookmakers in residence, nominally on the payroll, as news clerks. So they had runners right there in the New York Times office to handle the gambling bets that they wanted to lay down. And he stood out as somebody who was different. Uh, he didn't engage in the drinking, the drunkenness, the profanity, the gambling that all of his colleagues did, and that caused him to stand out, to shine as lights in a darkened world. Now, the interesting thing is that Matt Lewis writes this piece, and they and the secular left just unloaded on him. You know, we know schools of journalism are dominated by people on the left. If you uh, look at schools of journalism... The faculty is almost 9 to 1 liberal Democrat. I'm trying to remember what uh, organization it was. It was an, a school of education. So we're talking general, not just about journalism here, but about schools of higher education. Not a single dollar went to Mitt Romney in 2012. All of the money that was given by the faculty went to Barack Obama. Zero, zero dollars went to the Republican candidate. And it's interesting is Matt Lewis is the one that's being jumped on here. He says, like, I think 77% of America deserves to have some representation in the news industry and journalism, and instead they have landed on him like a falling safe. It's been a fascinating thing uh, to watch. Well, let's grab a couple of phone calls before we get to the bottom of the hour. Let's go to Roy in Richmond, Virginia. Roy, uh, welcome. Can we bring Roy in? Okay, we're working on Here we go. Roy, Richmond, Virginia. Welcome to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. What's on your mind? Thank you, Brian. It's an honor to be on your show again. Good to have you on. What's up? Uh, yeah, I wanted a trivia question. I heard you on Trivia Friday earlier, and I wanted the people in the audience could help us. Maybe we could come up with one problem that out-of-control and irresponsible government could actually solve. Okay, so you're not talking about a problem that's out of control because we are awash in those. 
So you're talking yep. about a problem that we could actually do something about. Do you have a suggestion? No, I'm saying we have an irresponsible and out-of-control government. How many problems do you think they can really solve? Well, you know, it's interesting, Roy. You know, I, I played the sound bites from Rand Paul yesterday saying that one of the first things we've got to come to grips with is that politicians do not have the solutions to these problems. A lot of these problems are issues of the heart. They're issues of the spirit. And government isn't going to have a solution for those things other than getting out of the way so that people motivated by their faith in God and self-reliance can go to work on these these problems. So, you know, I agree with you. Everything the government touches, it turns to powder. And so, right. uh, you know, if government, if increasing the size of government solved problems, we wouldn't have a problem left in the world. In fact, I read today, and I'll give you the last word here after I mention this, Roy, the, the government is going to bring in an all-time record. Over $2.7 trillion is going to come in in tax revenue this year. It's an all-time record, beating the record that Bush established in 2007. As a result, I might add, of the Bush tax cuts, they worked record-setting revenue in 2007. Now, this is the first year that's exceeded that. It's going to be $2.78 trillion, something like that. So clearly, Roy, what we have is not a revenue problem. We have a spending problem. Right. And that's why this country was founded upon limited government, not unlimited government. With unlimited government, you're going to have limited people. And, you know, I really called in to talk about Benghazi because I think it's a perfect example of how the Obama administration is deceiving the people and at the same time, they use it as an excuse to demonize Christians. And as far as I know, that fellow who made that video is still in jail somewhere. So don't tell me they won't come and lock Christians up for doing nothing. And, you know, either we're living in the wrong country or the communists or the Nazis have taken over. And I don't say that lightly, jokingly, or funnily. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really scaring me, Brian. And, you know, these people, they're all going down like Jay-Z and Beyonce, going to visit these Cuban countries and all these communist dictators and hanging out with the North Korean guy. But what does it really matter what happens with North Korea when we're being invaded from within? All right, Roy, listen, I appreciate that. Thank you. And I think a lot of people share that concern. And it's not going to be long before Christian supporters of Natchez Murray is going to have to wear some kind of Star of David so other people can recognize us, avoid us.